Hey guys, this is MacHeads101, and today I'm going to be talking about a machine learning algorithm called a Bayes classifier. To get started, I'm going to show you something cool you can do with Bayes classifiers. So here I have created a simple demo where I can type a sentence, something like, a, something like this, and it tells me whether that sentence has a positive sentiment or a negative sentiment, whether it's good or bad, basically. So if I say this product is bad, it says it's negative. If I say this product is good, it says it's positive. If I say I really liked the movie, it's positive. If I say I really hated the movie, it's negative. And all I had to do to get this to work was gather a bunch of sentences and label each one as either positive or negative. And then I just fed those sentences to my program and it learned what makes a sentence uh, good or bad. And this idea of sentiment analysis can actually be applied to a whole lot of things. So say you're a company and you just released a product, you can actually track Twitter, you know, and see what people are saying about your product and see if they're saying generally good things, generally negative things. And you could even take that a step further if you're like, you know, a stock trader, you could track a whole bunch of products and basically predict the stock market based on people's opinions about various products. Another thing you can do is uh, graph out the mood over the course of a piece of text. So I've taken a book, uh, in this case Stephen King's Under the Dome, and I've plotted basically the average sentiment over time throughout the book, and you can see it starts off kind of negative, kind of sad, then there's hope in the middle, then all hope is lost at the end, and at, at the end it's also a pretty negative sentiment throughout. So uh, this is just a way to analyze, you know, a piece of text using uh, an automated program. So I hope I've convinced you by this point that uh, base classifiers are actually pretty useful, even just for something like sentiment analysis. So before I get into the theory and the math behind base classifiers, I just want to give a really simple example, uh, which will show you kind of what we're after and what we're kind of getting at. So in this example, let's say we're trying to train a base classifier to do sentiment analysis, like I showed. And the only data we have are these seven sentences. So three of them are negative and four of them are positive. And based on this, we want the program to be able to draw inferences. So if we show it a new sentence, it just knows about these, you know, seven things that it's seen before. It has to decide for this new sentence whether it's positive or negative. So how can we make this happen? You know, how, it's pretty easy for us because, you know, we already have language, you know, you probably already speak English and have a good idea of feelings, but how could we get a program with just these sentences to learn what makes some of them good and some of them bad? And the answer in this case is pretty straightforward, actually. All of the positive ones use the word love, and all of the negative ones use some form of the word hate. And if, if we, you know, ideally, if we had a Bayes classifier or any kind of classifier, it would pick up on this and realize love is really important for things being positive, hate is really important for things being negative, so if I see a new sentence and it says love in it, it's going to be positive, and if it says hate in it, it's going to be negative. And if it says both, we don't really know what to do, because None of the training samples use both. Um, but we'll certainly get to that once we talk about the math behind a Bayes classifier. So after we had our computer learn from these sentences, you know, hopefully if it were to pick up on this love-hate pattern, we would be able to show it these two new sentences. Um, and one of them says hate and one of them says love. And based on that, it would be able to figure out that one of them is negative and one of them is positive. So this is just the idea that we're after, basically. You know, we want the program to be able to look at all of the sentences we show it and figure out which words are more likely to appear in positive sentences or which words are more likely to appear in negative sentences and just based on that make inferences about new things it's never seen before. And more generally, you know, it doesn't have to be about sentences and positive or negative sentiment. It can be about anything. Um, the idea is just figuring out, you know, which variables correlate to which uh, which classes, you know, which categorizations, basically. So now I want to turn this very abstract idea into an actual procedure that we can perform, uh, not just on sentiment analysis, but on anything. And I'm going to be using sentiment analysis as the example because it's pretty straightforward and I've shown you how cool it is. But you could think about this, you know, you could think about doing this with a lot of different things. So the first step when we're going to make a base classifier is we have to decide how we're going to represent a piece of data. So if we're doing sentiment analysis, a piece of data is maybe a sentence or you know just a piece of text in general. How are we going to represent that piece of text? 
Well, the way I've described representing a piece of text uh, previously is, you know, the appearance of certain words. So I might describe a sentence as, uh, you know, it has the word love, it doesn't have the word hate, it has the word elephant, it doesn't have the word monkey, and I could go on, you know, through all, you know, how many 60,000, 30,000 words that we think are important. And I could describe every single sentence as, you know, a vector basically of yes or no values. You know, does it have it? Doesn't, doesn't it have it? Uh, another way to describe a piece of text would be counting. You know, I could say it has the word love two times, it has the word hate one time. And you can imagine that might be a little better if we're looking at long pieces of text, like a, like a newspaper article, where, you know, the longer the piece of text, the more likely any given word is going to appear in it. Uh, and at some point you have to start counting. You can't just say, does it have the word hate in it? Because a long novel will have the word hate in it, even if it's not, you know, a very negative novel. So this is, this is the, the first thing we have to decide. How are we going to represent the data, you know, the variables in the data? For the purposes of this video, we're pretty much going to be sticking to the model of, you know, does the sentence have the word or doesn't it have the word? Because this is just a really simple way to represent a sentence. And for short pieces of text, like tweets, it works great. And uh, it's just the easiest thing to understand. Um, and this is, by the way, called, I think, Bernoulli Naive Bayes, something along those lines. So if you want to look it up, just look up the word Bernoulli. I'll probably have that in the description. So now I want to give a really simple example of actually building a Bernoulli Naive Bayes classifier, just using a really limited vocabulary of three words. Because we, in real life, we would probably use thousands of words. Uh, and, you know, we would look for the appearance of all of those words. But in this example, just to make things simple, we're only going to be looking at the three words, love, hate, and elephant. And we're only going to be looking at 12 sentences uh, and, you know, how those sentences use these, these words. So in this case, I gathered six positive sentences and six negative sentences. And I built this table of whether each sentence used the word love, whether each sentence used the word hate, and whether each sentence used the word elephant. So you can see the first two positive sentences use the word love and didn't use the word hate and didn't use the word elephant. So that's pretty, pretty much what we would expect. The next two positive sentences actually didn't use any of the three words in our vocabulary, so we can't say much about, about sentences of that nature. And then the last two said love. One of them also said hate, which isn't, which isn't what we would expect. You know, maybe they were talking about a love-hate relationship or something like that. Uh, and one of them actually said elephant. So, this is going to be interesting, and if you look at the negative examples, you know, three of the negatives use the word hate. Uh, so how would we, you know, based on these, these statistics, you know, if we didn't know anything else about the sentence besides whether it used the word love, whether it used the word hate and the word elephant, you know, how would we decide for a new sentence whether it's positive or negative? So this is where we have to start bringing in some math. Uh, and what we're going to be doing is we're going to be computing things called conditional probabilities. All that really means is, you know, if I tell you I've given you a sentence that's positive, has positive sentiment, I want to know the probability of seeing the word love. Or I give you a sentence, I tell you it's negative, what's the probability that the word elephant will be inside that sentence? So a conditional probability is just a probability conditioned on something, in this case conditioned on whether the sentence is positive or negative. And we're actually pretty much set up to compute these probabilities with the data we have in front of us. Because I've already split it up into positive and negative tables. So all we have to do is compute a probability for the positive table, and that'll be conditioned on, you know, a positive sentence. And we compute probabilities for the negative table, and that's conditioned on a negative sentence. And I think you'll see what I mean in a second when I actually go through the math. So let's actually just start thinking about uh, these probabilities. So let's say I have a positive sentence, and I want to know what's the probability that it has the word love? Uh, well, we have six positive sentences in total, you know, six rows in the table, and four of them have the word, uh, they have the word love in them. So four out of six is the probability that a positive sentence will have the word love. And let's say we want to know the probability that a positive sentence will have the word hate. Well, there's six positive sentences still, only one of them has the word hate in it, so there's a one out of six chance that a positive sentence will have the word hate. And we could go through and do this for some negatives, so there's like, you know, three out of six negatives with the word hate, so three out of six probability that, the, uh, that a negative sentence will have the word hate. And we would get probabilities like the ones I've written at the bottom here, just the probability of, you know, basically how many, you know, out of all of the entries in that column, how many of them have 
a yes in there. So this is what we get, and these are our conditional probabilities. You know, the conditional probability of seeing each word given the, you know, the, the sentiment of the sentence. And now uh, we're pretty much done looking at the actual data. We've basically gotten these probabilities from this data, and we don't need the data anymore. So I'm just going to make a more compact version of these two tables, just with these probabilities we came up with and not with any of the data. So you can see our 4 sixth for love and positive is still there, our 3 sixths for hate and negative is still there. Uh, all of our stats are still there. I just got rid of all of the yeses and no's uh, that we had from our data. And now I pretty much need to touch on two pretty basic probability ideas. The first being, if I have the probability of something happening, I can easily figure out the probability of that not happening. Because if I know the probability of love appearing in a positive sample is 4 sixths, there's 2 sixths left. So I know the probability love doesn't appear is, you know, 1 minus 4 sixths, which is 2 sixths. So uh, I can create those tables here just for you to see, you know, if I subtract the probability of a thing happening from 1, what I get out is the probability that that thing doesn't happen. So this is the idea of complementary probabilities. Uh, it's pretty basic, and we're going to be using this a lot. The second thing I want to talk about is uh, not something I can really easily make a slide for, but uh, it's the idea of independence. So let's say I have a coin and, you know, there's a, you know, a, a one-half chance I flip heads and a one-half chance I flip tails. Well, if I asked you what's the chance I flip heads three times, I would flip it one time, flip it a second time, flip it a third time, and uh, not, no one of those flips influences another flip. You know, they're independent events. There's always a one-half chance of, of me flipping heads at any given flip of this coin. The past flips don't affect what happens. So if I want to know the chance I flip heads three times in a row, I take the chance I flipped it the first time, times the chance I flipped it the second time, times the chance I flipped it the third time, so it's one-half times one-half times one-half, which gives me one-eighth. So the idea is, if I have things which occur independently, and I want the probability of all of them happening at the same time, I just multiply the probabilities of, uh, of, each, of each thing, and that gives me the probability that they all happen simultaneously. And we're going to be applying that by making the assumption that each word is independent in a, in a sentence. So, uh, for instance, I might assume that love, hate, and elephant are each independent events. You know, if love is there, it doesn't influence whether hate is there, things like that, given, given that it's a positive sample or a negative sample. And so this assumption allows me to figure out, okay, the chance that love and hate appear is the probability of love times the probability of hate. So it allows me to do things like that where I can just multiply probabilities to get the probability of both things happening at once. It's actually worth asking, you know, is this assumption a valid assumption to make? You know, even if it's a positive sentence, if I use a certain word like love, I'm probably a lot less likely to use a different word like adore or, you know, something that means love, like a synonym of love, because I've already used love. There's a lot of things like that where you might think words actually aren't independent of each other in English. Uh, and despite the fact that assuming words are independent is so wrong and so, like, naive, this, uh, this technique still actually works. So we're making an assumption which isn't even remotely true, but yet we're still going to get really amazing results. And uh, you can kind of think about maybe why it works, but uh, it just does. So just beware that we are making an assumption and that assumption is actually patently false, but it's going to be okay. So now I want to actually go on and uh, work on some sentences and use this classifier to decide uh, if those sentences are positive or negative. And as I do that, I will show you actually how we do that, you know, how we're going to use these probability principles I've just explained uh, to actually decide, the, you know, the sentiment of a sentence. So let's have a look at this sentence. I really love my pet elephant. This sentence has the word love, the word elephant, and it doesn't have the word hate. So here's how we're going to decide whether this sentence is positive or negative. First, we're going to assume that the sentence is positive. And we're going to say, well, what is the chance of this sentence? You know, if we're assuming it's positive, what, what was the probability that I would get a sentence with the word love, the word elephant, and not the word hate? And to do that, we multiply the probability of love times the probability of not hate times the probability of elephant, all given, you know, all from the positive table. Then we're going to assume instead that it's negative, and we're going to do the same thing. The probability of love times the probability of not hate times the probability of elephant, you know, using this uh, negative table. And we're going to see which one is more likely. You know, if it was positive, 
is this sentence more likely than if it was negative? You know, that kind of thing. And we're just going to compare those numbers and make a decision. So let's actually go through and do that. So if this sentence was positive, since it has the word love, there's a four-sixths chance of that. It has, it's missing the word hate, so the chance that it had the word hate was one-sixth. So the chance that it doesn't have the word hate is one minus one-sixth. And it has the word elephant, the chances of that were one-sixth. So we multiply four-sixths by five-sixths by one-sixth, and we get 0.093. We can do the same thing for negative. The chance of seeing love in a negative sentence is one-sixth. The chance of seeing hate is three-sixths, so the chance of not seeing hate is one minus three-sixths, and the chance of seeing elephant is one-sixth. So we get 0.014 in that case. The chance of it being positive is much higher than the chance of it being negative. Or I should word that differently. The chance of seeing the sentence if, if it was positive is a lot higher than the chance of seeing the sentence if it was negative. So if we were, if we were really pissed off, the chances we would write this sentence are you know, really sad or something like that. The chances we would write this sentence are a lot lower. So using this information, we conclude that the sentence is positive. Something I think is important to note at this point is that the word elephant didn't actually matter because we saw the word elephant, so we multiplied by 1 over 6 when we were doing the positive case and by 1 over 6 when we were doing the negative case. You know, elephant had the same likelihood for positive samples and negative samples. And as a result, you know, we didn't really have to multiply by the elephant probability at all because we, we shrunk it by the same amount for positive and negatives. You know, we multiplied by 1 over 6 in both cases. So, uh, the answer would have been the same and will always be the same whether or not we count elephant. And this is nice because intuitively the word elephant doesn't really, you know, tell us whether a sentence is good or bad, you know, is positive or negative. And it shows that a Bayes classifier, you know, if there's a word that's basically not correlated at all with the categorization you want, it's, it's essentially equivalent to just ignoring that category, you know, we ignore the one six. You know, it, we implicitly ignore it, you know, we can multiply it by the 1, 6, but it doesn't really change which one is greater than the other one. So, that's just something I think is important to note, is how uh, the base classifier naturally basically ignores variables that don't matter. So now I'm just going to do one more example before the end of the video, uh, just so we have another case to deal with. And this is going to be a situation where, you know, before we had the sentences with love and hate, and uh, I asked what would happen if love and hate both appeared in the same sentence, and now we can address questions like that. So let's say we have this sentence, I love and hate my elephant, right? Actually, as a person, I'm not sure whether to call this positive or negative, but uh, we can just see what the Bayes classifier does. So if we actually were to do the same thing we did before, we can multiply the probability of love times the probability of hate times the probability of elephant for both positive and negative, and actually it came out that uh, positive, <clears throat> they were pretty close, but positive actually won out a little bit. And the reason positive won in this case is because love happened in four out of the six positive cases, whereas hate only happened in three out of the six negative cases. So love actually is our, like, kind of our pivot in this case because love is more strongly associated with a positive sentiment than hate is associated with a negative sentiment in this case. So because we've been able to turn this into numerical things, you know, hate only appeared in three of our things, whereas love appeared in four of them, you know, because we made this numerical instead of just the kind of intuitive or qualitative, we can actually make decisions where it's not so obvious what the decision would be. And actually, you know, I'm not sure if we would even agree with this, you know, is this really slightly more positive than negative, you know, is love generally, because I didn't, you know, 12 sentences isn't enough to get a good sense, but if we had a lot of sentences and it turned out love really did happen more often in a positive sentence than hate happened in a negative sentence, we might draw a similar conclusion. that This sentence might feel a little more positive to a person reading it than it would feel negative. So that's just something to think about, maybe more of a philosophical question. Um, how do we deal with ties like this? Uh, and this is the, the answer in the case of the Bayesian classifier. So anyway, I hope you learned something. Uh, thanks for watching and goodbye.